If you cannot, simply cannot understand what's happening in the country and in the world now, I might have the explanation. You may, at least until recently, have been labouring under the misapprehension that the state has your back, that those in power have your best interests at heart. Let me make it clear that I use the word state deliberately. These words are not directed solely at the government or even just parliament, but at the whole edifice of those in positions of power, elected and not. If, like me, you no longer believe the state has your back, it's at least likely that you know, indeed are surrounded by many that still do. You or those around you may still believe that decisions are being taken, plans set in place by those at the top of the food chain, with a view to securing and perpetuating the world your ancestors worked for, in some cases gave their lives for. You or they may have thought that the indigenous culture of these islands, nurtured for a thousand years, was still held dear by those occupying positions of power and responsibility. But no, as far as I'm concerned, that's no longer the case and hasn't been the case for a good long while. Understand and accept this much at least and the otherwise bewildering sense of confusion goes away at once. It's such a relief. So much of what's happening now, crashing economy, livelihoods destroyed, dismal care of physical and mental health, educations compromised or worse, a so-called green agenda prioritised at all costs and regardless of harms done by subsidies on bills, those subsidies that are the only, absolutely the only reason any private company ever raised a wind turbine or invested in solar panels for British skies, VAT on fuel, spiralling costs of food and essentials, deliberately destructive setting aside of farmland and discouragement of farmers and farming as an industry in a time of global food insecurity, domestic and international travel made so problematic as to be hardly worth the bother, the looming prospect of digital IDs, the rise of digital currencies instead of money, all of these troubling realities and more. All of it makes sense once you apply the keep it simple principle. What we are witnessing is no longer a state working to serve us and to protect our shared heritage, institutions, culture and way of life. Rather, we're watching their deliberate destruction and dismantling ready for replacement with something else. Many of those in place in our institutions, in government, in parliament, civil service, academia, even the church, evidently loathe this country. It's that simple. They loathe what this country has been, what to some extent at least it still is. Furthermore, they despise those who value what has been and who wish to see all of that conserved and handed on to future generations. These islands are presided over now by ideologues committed to the wholesale demolition of what has been Britain and British and its replacement with the product of some parasitic ideology shaped in their own image. In times such as these, there's often an appetite for and calls for revolution. I would advise against such means. Revolutions are for the birds, always a disaster in the end. Revolutions devour their children, as a wise man said. The preferable solution is to maintain all that is good, all that has served as well. Maintain the foundations of the old house and as much of the structure above as is still sound. Root out the rot and treat the woodworm, repair and replace what's broken, but keep as much as possible of what has stood the test of time, what has worked. The bitter irony is that it appears that a revolution is indeed being planned, in fact has been long in the planning and is now being rolled out. In the past it was kings and nation states that feared revolution by the common people, the slaves. Now it's the state itself that's fomenting revolution from within. The rot is at the core, at the heart. By contrast, it's the people, we the people, who want the country and the culture and the heritage saved and who must therefore resist the state-sponsored revolution with all the strength we have. We're told by them that pain is coming and that the pain must be endured. Suddenly they're all saying it at once all over the world, yet another script parroted in unison like Build Back Better, only worse. But that pain is for us alone, we the proles, those with the money and power will glide above it all in their private jets, leaving in their wake contrails of CO2 that might as well scribble on the sky the message, suck it up, peasants. They'll push burgers made of bugs at us while they sit down to coat de boeuf. We'll have real pain and they'll have champagne. We'll have nothing and they'll be happy. Or so they like to think. Again and again I turn to the keep it simple philosophy, what some call Occam's razor. 
If it seems to make no sense that 30 million petrol and diesel cars might be replaced with electric alternatives powered by a non-existent infrastructure, that's because the simpler explanation is that almost none of us are meant to have cars at all, electric or otherwise. If you wonder why in the US and here in Britain we're turning our backs on fracking and other sources of power under our feet and beneath our surrounding seas, it's because the intention is that we in the troublesome West should have much, much less energy available to us as ordinary people than before. The intention is not to go green. The intention is that we should go without. As part of the revolution, the state is laying plans to hinder any protest or dissent. The so-called online safety bill is nothing less than a whole new way to ensure the censorship and silencing of any who would challenge the hobbling of our rights and freedoms, our herding like cattle towards a digital slavery in which our every financial transaction Every communication, every movement, every meeting, every word might be monitored in real time and also judged against a code of behaviour drafted by people we do not see and cannot know. We stand to be judged against standards set to curtail every aspect of our being and whenever it suits the state we'll be found wanting and punished as a consequence. This is the weekend of the Platinum Jubilee. Jubilee is a word with an interesting backstory. It has deep roots in the Hebrew word jobel which is a ram, or more specifically a trumpet made from a ram's horn. In ancient times, thousands of years ago, the Jobel was sounded to announce the Year of Atonement, a regular event when all debts were written off unconditionally and completely, thus freeing those who had been enslaved to rich people because they owed them money. US economist Michael Hudson has written that as long ago as the time of the Assyrians, 4,000 years ago, it was understood that economies always became unstable and ultimately collapsed when too many people simply could not settle their debts to the rich and through no fault of their own. The solution, understood and applied for thousands of years, was that periodically all debts had to be cancelled. This was a jubilee. Jesus Christ understood the need to write off debt to save society. The older Greek version of the Lord's Prayer says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Only much later, when the church had made it a matter of craven morality to repay every debt, were the words debts and debtors replaced with trespasses and trespassers. By then, the church was in cahoots with the rich. In his first sermon in the synagogue, Jesus told the congregation he had come to bring a clean slate debt cancellation, what he called the year of the Lord. This, the cancelling of otherwise unpayable debt to Rome and the Romans, was the basis of his message of hope to the downtrodden. The economic mess we're in now is not the fault of we, the little people, but of the banks and their ruinous recklessness in pursuit of obscene profit. In 2008, they got to write off their mistakes with the help of eye-watering amounts of taxpayers' money to cancel their debts. Those same banks don't want to do the same for us, though. Far from it. The bankers and the rest of the super-rich elite want to foreclose on those in debt. When that happens, the rich elite will own everything, and we will own nothing. Sound familiar? In this year of jubilee, I would say we have a lot to learn from ancient wisdom. To remember that our ancestors knew the fight that mattered was to prevent the population falling into bondage to the elite who wanted to own everything. I very much doubt that a jubilee for the people an unconditional cancelling of all debt is quite the great reset those of the elite have in mind. They need us to owe them so that they own us. Bankers always say debts must always be paid or there'll be chaos. They would say that, wouldn't they? I've said it before and I'll say it again. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. This is the time of waking up and understanding that the state is not to be trusted. Not anymore and not for a long time. All of this is the stuff they used to call conspiracy theory. Call it as much if it blows your skirt up. I no longer care. In my book, those they call conspiracy theorists are more accurately described as the ones who saw it all coming. <laughs>